we just ask you to move in this place and move in our hearts and speak to us and change us today by the power of your word. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, 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 man. So glad to have everybody. We put out a lot of extra chairs, and so some of these rows up here are kind of empty. Some of you could move it. Poor, poor Kwame. All lonely over there. Poor Liz, so lonely. <laughs> Okay, nobody moved to fill the rows. All righty then. That's fine. Well, I know that you're like wondering. Now you left poor Gilbert all alone. <laughs> it's fine. You guys don't have to move. I'm just being silly. All right. Go back to your seat. I know you guys are probably wondering what in the world is this gold coin doing? You wish it was a gold coin, right? But it is a delicious chocolate gold coin. We'll get to that here in just a minute. So don't eat it just yet. You're like, oops, I already ate it. Well, grab another one. Just go ahead and grab one and make sure you got one for yourself. And um, I'm going to tell you when to eat it or when to do whatever you want to with it here in just a minute. But uh, today we're going to continue in the series that we started last Sunday, Lost and Found, right? Lost and Found. And um, we've been talking about things that are lost and how they get found, things that got lost that Jesus came to find. And I want us to read our main scripture, which is Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Last week I gave you 1919. That was a typo. I'm sorry, but it is 1910. It says, uh, for the son of man came to seek and save those who are what? Lost. Jesus did not come to bring a new religion. That's not why Jesus came. Jesus did not come to bring a political revolution. Jesus did not come to bring a social reformation, even though many people have made the gospel of Jesus Christ about these things, right? Gee, it's a new religion. It's a social reformation. It's a political revolution. No, no, no. Jesus didn't come to do any of that. Jesus didn't even just come to help us become a better world, right? A lot of people think Jesus came to give us this great example and just to leave us this example to follow and make the world a better place, right? No, that really isn't what the gospel amounts to. He didn't even come to just teach us the truth. Jesus came to rescue you and to rescue me from a dead end. Jesus came to bring light to our darkness. Jesus came to pay a price that I could never pay and that you could never pay the price for our sins. Jesus came to defeat an enemy you and I would never be able to defeat, to be able to defeat. None of us could ever defeat this enemy called sin, this enemy called Satan. We could never defeat him. Jesus came to defeat the enemy we could not defeat. We were totally desperately completely, come on, say the word with me, lost. And he came to find us and bring us home to the Father. So we've been talking lost and found. Last week and this week, we're looking at some things in the Bible that were lost that Jesus came to find. And uh, like we said last week, really, it's all just about, what is it about? Me. It's all about. You can say that. Don't feel bad about it. Just say, it's all about me. It really is. Last week we talked, what do we talk about? What was lost? The two sons, right? The brothers, they were both lost. Was one more lost than the other? No, they were equally lost in different ways, right? The young rebellious son and the old self-righteous son, but they were both equally lost. They were both equally separated from their father right? And we learned that sin doesn't just take us a little bit away from God. Where does it move us? Sin moves us to far, far away, right? Sin moves us far, far away from God. And when it all boils, when it all comes to the end, when it all boils down to the end knowing the gospel, knowing what Jesus came to do, we're all faced with a, a choice. Everyone has a choice to make. Jesus came to find us. 
Jesus came to rescue us. Jesus came to bring us home to the Father. But just like both of those sons had to decide if they were going to go into the party or not, the rebellious son had to decide to go home. The older brother had to decide if he was going to go into the party or not. We all have to decide about our own relationship with God. And just like we learned about the lost sons last Sunday, today we're going to learn about lost sheep and coins. Lost sheep and lost coins. So let's go back to Luke chapter 15. We're going to read the first part of the chapter this time. Luke 15 is actually all about lost stuff. (laughs) It's all about lost stuff that Jesus came to find. All right, let's read uh, verse 1 through 10 today. Tax collectors and other, what? Notorious sinners. Not, I mean, what does it mean to be notorious? Everybody know. I mean, come on. It's not just the guy back in a corner doing something he shouldn't be doing and nobody knows about it, right? It's the guy that's out there living the life, doing what he wants to do and, every, and isn't ashamed about it, right? They were notorious. They were known for being bad, all right? It says they often came to listen to Jesus teach. Not just the really bad guys, but the really bad guys who were known for being bad by everybody else, they like to come listen to Jesus teach. Now, I've, this just puzzles me. Does it puzzle you? The holiest of holy in all the universe, Jesus Christ. Perfect in holiness and perfection and purity and righteousness. There's not one stain on Jesus. Holy. And the worst of the worst like to come hang out with him. That isn't normally the way things go, is it? The second thing that's funny is this this made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was even associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So the holy of holy, the holiest of holy, the definition of holy, Jesus, and the bad guys like to hang out with him. And the quote unquote good guys, the religious guys, they did not like Jesus at all. They, like, they actually were the ones who plotted to kill him. Doesn't that seem like a contradiction? What, you know, when we normally think, we think, well, quote, unquote, religious people, they're the ones who like God. <laughs> and the bad people over there, they don't like God. But G- there was something about Jesus. There was just something about Jesus that let people know that even though they were bad and they knew they were bad and everybody else knew they were bad, they knew that there was something about him that they could trust. They knew that there was something about him that they wanted and they were trying to find out what it was. And so they wanted to hang out with him. And the coolest thing of all was holy of holiest, the holiest of all holies, Wanted to hang out with them too. In fact, he liked to go to dinner with them. We talked about Zacchaeus a few weeks back when Jesus is like, I'm coming to your house for supper tonight, right? Verse three, this made the Pharisees mad, right? So Jesus told them this story. Why did he, why is Jesus about to tell this story? He's trying to help us understand this dichotomy, this contradiction, right? He's trying to help us understand why it was that he was all about notorious sinners and that religious people didn't seem to like him, all right? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go search for the one that is lost until he what? Finds it, lost and found. Verse five, and when he has found it, not if he finds it, when he has found it, How is he going to carry it home on his shoulders? Joyfully. Come on, show me some joy this morning. You guys have got awful, oh my Lord, got awful, awful, uh, um, that was Nacho Libre joy. Come on, give me a, how many of you have seen Nacho Libre? Come on, give me a Steven smile, a Skeleto smile, right? It says, it doesn't just say, oh, he found it and brought it back, you know, get, get back in the herd, man, get back in the flock. No, it says he'll joyfully put it on his shoulders and bring it back home, right? 
And then when he arrives, verse 6, he'll call together all his friends and neighbors. I mean, this guy is happy, right? Saying, rejoice with me because I found my lost sheep. In the same way, there's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Wow. Verse 8, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Now take the coin in your hand. A few weeks ago, I gave you juicy fruit, and Julian walked to count the offerings or something. He walked back in, and he said, and he walked back in here, and it smelled like a juicy fruit factory, right? I kept preaching. You guys kept blowing bubbles and all that kind of stuff. It was great. Today, I'm going to get dark, chocolatey smiles and amens. All right. Suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she'll call in her friends and neighbors and and do the same thing. Rejoice with me because I found my lost coin. In the same way, there's joy in the presence of God's angels, even when one sinner repents. In this story, you guys, what was lost? Or in these two stories, what was lost that needed to be found? Number one was one individual sheep got lost and needed to be found to come back to his individual place in the flock. Okay, and then one coin, this is about one coin and its extreme importance in the lump sum. Okay, one, if this is the one penny that you need to make a dollar. Okay, it's extreme importance. And this represents how extremely high of a value God places on my and your individual personal relationship with him, okay? Your individual personal relationship with him. Just like we learned from the lost sons last week, we learned three major things. Today, we're gonna learn three more major things, all right? I want want us to say them together, and then we're gonna go through them. The first one is, come on, let's read it together. Sorry, point number one. Come on, ready? God has a different perspective. Come on, read it again. God has a different perspective. Number two, Jesus' goal is relationship, not religion. And number three, joy, joy, joy. joy. For all of you Duck Dynasty fans, happy, 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 right? Is that from Duck Dynasty or Swamp People? One of them people, one of them bearded people that, Love the swamp and love fishing, and I actually like the swamp and fishing too. So happy, 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 joy, joy, joy. All right. So first one, God has a different perspective. So I want you to think about this, all right? You know, Jesus talks about 100 and he talks about 10, all right? Think of, you can think of it however you want. You can think in terms of 10 or you can think in terms of 100, however makes you think better, all right? Whatever is your better proportion of thinking in your brain. I like 100 just because it's bigger, all right? God has a very different perspective about lost things. He has a very different perspective about lost things. So I want you, I really want you to think about this, okay? If you had $100 and it was $101 bills in a stack, all right? $101 bills, all right? and you lost one of them, you'd probably look in a few obvious places to see where it may be, right? I mean, if I had a hundred one dollar bills, and for some reason, all of a sudden, there's only 99, I'd probably check my pockets. I'd probably go to the dirty laundry and make sure it's not. I'd probably look in the washing machine and see if it hadn't been washed and came out. I'd probably look in my car seat or see if it somehow got folded weird in my wallet. And after a few minutes of looking, I probably wouldn't sweat $1 out of 100. How about you? Probably not. I mean, probably I would be on my way. If I were Liz, I would be right on my way to buy a pair of shoes. I'd be out there. Look, I would be, or, or, or a, a new fishing pole or, I don't know, some new cologne or whatever. I'd be out there to enjoy, thank you very much, my $99. Because in 100 bucks, what's $1 anyway? But think about it this way. What if there were something that you wanted really, really bad? Like really bad. 
Like really, 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 really bad. Have you thought of it yet? Like something you'd really, really like to have. And it cost exactly $100.00 cents. $100. What you thinking about that one lost dollar now? I would turn the house upside down. If that pair of shoes that you've been eyeing for three months cost exactly $100 and you got $100 and you're ready to go buy it and all of a sudden you lost a dollar, oh Lord, I would take the washing machine apart and pull the dollar out. I would go through every piece of dirty laundry until I find that dollar. I would look under in, my, in the cracks in the couch and in the car seats and all. I would, until I find that dollar. Why? Because that one dollar could separate me and keep me from having that prized possession. Because I don't want, you know, by golly, I got a hundred dollars to buy a brand new pair of, I don't know, tell me some expensive shoes. You said them all. Crocs, no. <laughs> A brand new pair, listen for me, a brand new pair of, I haven't had a good pair of cowboy boots in a while. All right. I, had, I used to have some really nice ones. I don't know what happened to those things. Jarrett's going to help me find them. All right. Some new ones, I mean. And they cost exactly $100. And I lost one. See, that $1 could keep me from getting what I want. 99 really doesn't mean that much anymore when one can keep you from getting what you want. Yeah? So go ahead and eat that one coin if you want. And if you want to eat two, you can, but then you don't go along with the story. Just kidding. You can eat as many as you want until they go away. All right. One coin, one sheep was lost. Yes, there were 10. There were 99 and when we think about things that get lost, we kind of think, well, if I have a lot of them, what's the big deal if I, you know, lost just one? I'll just enjoy the rest and just forget about the other one, right? God has a very, very big different perspective than us. And I want you to understand something. There's one thing God wants more than anything else. There is one prized possession for him, and it's you. It's you. He made you in his image to love you, bless you, and be loved by you. You are not just one in 10. You are not, to God, just one in 100, or one in 7 billion, for that matter, people on the face of the earth. You're not that to him. Yes, you are one, and I am one. We are individuals. But God does not look at individual people like we look at individual things. To God, you're not part of the crowd. To God, you're not just another face in the crowd. To God, you have an extremely high individual value and no one else in the entire earth possesses your exact value. It's you and only you. There's only one you. There might be people that look like you. There might be people that have a similar personality as you. There might be people that have similar skills and gifts and that, as you, but there is only one you, even if you're a twin. There's something about you that's different than everybody else in the entire world. And we can see that in our fingerprints, right? There's only one you. There's only one you for him. And he values you as the only you. Come on, tell your neighbor, you're the only you. Thank you, Jesus. Just kidding. Okay. You really are. You really are the only you. Now, we don't really, a lot of times we don't think about each other like that. I mean, let's just be honest. We look at crowds and we see crowds. When God looks at crowds, he sees every single individual person and every single one of their individual value. That's the way God looks at lost things. 
Now, I mean, he, of course, God loves the crowds. I mean, of course, God loves a crowd. Why does he love a crowd? Because he loves each one in the crowd, right? The value of a crowd is determined by the individual value of each person. Okay? Why am I saying this? Because I want us also as a church to have this attitude. Okay? We have a crowd of 40 to 50 something people here every Sunday. And I believe this crowd is going to grow. We're eventually going to be 100 and 200 and hundreds more. This is going to grow. Okay? And we have to understand something about God and we have to embrace this way of this perspective for ourselves. Yes. We love a crowd. We want our church to grow. We want more butts in the seats. We want to open another service. We want a bigger building with more chair. We want to do all this stuff. But listen, we only love crowds because we love every individual person. Because that is God's perspective on people. Okay? The value of a crowd is determined by each individual's value. Why am I saying all of this? This will make sense, I promise. First, you've got to understand your high value to God as an individual. But second, this has to help you understand the gospel as a whole. Je- listen, Jesus came to die on the cross for you. Come on, just touch yourself there, me. See, we we say this, and and sometimes we don't get it. Yeah, Jesus came to die for the world. Yes, he did. Jesus came to die for humanity. Jesus came to die for everyone. But it's just that. Jesus came to die for everyone. Everyone, that's you, That's me. We have an individual high value before God. John 3.16 says it the best. I love it. This is a verse that we hear a lot, right? But it says, God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that every one who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Jesus was going to come to earth to save humanity. Jesus was going to come to earth to die for the sins of all mankind, to carry all of our sins on himself, to pay the price that you and I could never pay so that all humanity, so that all creation could be redeemed, so all of us could be forgiven. But he loved the entire world so much that he came and went to the cross so that every one who would believe would not perish, but have eternal life. Yes, Jesus loves the world, but he loves you. He loves the world because he loves every single one in the world as an individual. So please, look at yourself differently. It's okay to say, I'm the only me. I'm pretty cool, actually. God made me, me. There's no other me. And he loves me. I'm saying this because some of you have a hard time with that. Yeah, God loves people. God loves everybody. No, 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 no. Come on, just, why don't you say it? God loves me. Me. You are And I am that one lost coin, that one lost sheep that has a value outside of the lump sum or the crowd or the flock. You're special. You're very, very, very special. Understand he's not mad with you if you're lost. He isn't. We... A lot of times think, I messed up, so God must be mad with me. Um, No, he's not mad with you. His heart breaks because the one individual that he loves is gone. He's not mad with you. Yes, his heart breaks for you. He's upset, you could say. But not because you're bad. (laughs) It's because you're lost. And he wants you with him. 
you've got to see this from the right perspective. I love the fact that it says the shepherd went to get the sheep. He didn't wait for the sheep to come back. He'll come get you where you are. <laughs> he really will. I, he knows where you are too. <laughs> he knows exactly where you are. And he'll come get you. He's not going to wait for you to just try to find your way back to him. Because, I mean, how many of us have tried to do that and it just really doesn't work? Right? Let me try to find God. Let me try to do things right. Let me try to get my life in order and please God. It just doesn't work. He doesn't wait for us to find our way back to him. He goes where we are and finds us and brings us back. And he doesn't even expect us to walk back. It says he picks us up and puts us on his shoulder and he carries us back. God knows you don't know the way. Thank the Lord that he doesn't depend on me to know what is right from wrong, to know what's the right way to go. He doesn't depend on me to know that. He picks me up and carries me and shows me the right way. And he brings me back to the right place so that I can keep walking in the right way. Praise the Lord for that. He doesn't wait on us. He comes after us. How many of you can remember today you might be here and you might, I'm, I am the lost coin. I am the lost sheep. But if you know, you know what? I was lost and I've been found. Remember when you were lost. Remember yourself months or years ago when you were, like Kwame was telling us on his testimony today, I was that lonely guy shut up in my room or I was this the girl depressed or whatever. Remember where you were and how Jesus came after you. He didn't wait on you to just come try to find your way to him. His relationship with you was way more important than your relationship with him would ever be. He was after a relationship with you, not you were after a relationship with him. He comes and he finds us and then he carries us. Let him carry you. Stop trying to fix your life on your own and to try to make it happen and to try to live right for God. Let him carry you back to the right place to start anyway in a close relationship with him. And in a close relationship with him, you will learn how to live right. You'll learn. Another thing, don't misunderstand this. Each of the 99, all of the other 99 were very precious to the shepherd. They were all each individuals just like this lost one. So you don't, don't think, well, you know, I've been following Jesus and I'm, I'm really, really in love with Jesus. And what, am I not that important? No, you're very, very, very important. You're just as important as the lost one he's going to find. Why? Because you were once that one. <laughs> now, the, the thing now is that you're already safe and sound and secure. You're already in the joy, right? You already know the joy of that relationship with him. You're already safe. All of that to say, he loves you. Not he loves you, how he loves us. No, 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 no. How he loves me, okay? Number one, God has a different perspective on lost stuff. Number two, Jesus' goal is relationship, not religion. That's why he ate with sinners instead of just preaching at them. Why? Because he wanted relationship. Preaching to people is good, but that doesn't show relationship. And see, Jesus' goal was not to get bad people to become good. No, 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 no. Jesus, listen, please get this because a lot of people think this. Jesus' goal is not to get you to, quote, unquote, live right. That's not his goal. Jesus' goal is a relationship with you that will lead you to live right. His goal isn't just for you to learn how to live right so you can please him. His goal is for you to be in a close relationship with him so that you can learn what he likes and dislikes, and then you can do it. Jesus didn't go to sinners and just teach and preach to them. Jesus showed their value by eating with them, by hanging out with them. No, Jesus didn't go and do the stuff they did. I'm not, please don't get me wrong. Jesus' goal was not to leave sinners as sinners. When Jesus comes to us, he doesn't come to us and then leave us the same. He changes us radically. We go from darkness to light, 
Lost to found, dead to alive, yes. But his goal is not to come to you and just straighten you out. His goal is to come find you and bring you to himself, relationship with himself. And then you will be able to live right. People say, I'm going to live right so I can be in relationship with Jesus. But that doesn't work. That's called religion. Just say the word religion. Blah. Okay? That doesn't work. Let me live right so I can be in relationship with him. No. Let me be in close relationship with him so that I can live right. Yeah? He wanted to show them their value to God so that they could not just experience a change of behavior, but a change of heart. See, when a lost person realizes how valuable they are to God, the heart changes. The desires change. It's no longer, oh man, I'm wrong, I need to do right. Mm -mm. The way it happens is, oh my God. God, how he loves me. I want to do right. I want to. I want to please him. It's a heart thing. If I just try to change the bad behavior on the outside without realizing how valuable I am to God, then my heart won't change. I could become one of these that don't even like Jesus called a Pharisee. That I try to do it all right on the outside, but there's no change of heart on the inside. And eventually, that all just runs out too. And eventually you find yourself super messed up again. It's a heart change. And the only way our hearts can change is when we realize that he's after my heart. He's after relationship. He's not after my behavior. Okay? Okay. I did not say it's all about the heart. It doesn't matter how you act and how you live. I did say if your heart changes, your behavior will change, period. Another thing, I mentioned this a few weeks ago. We had an encounter night, and we were talking about, uh, from a different angle, about the sheep. But I wanted to say this again. It doesn't matter how the sheep got lost. It doesn't matter, okay? What matters is for it to be found. Some of us wander away. We get like, I don't know, we just get unfocused, and we wander away from our relationship with the Lord. Some of us, um, some of us get tricked by the devil. Some of us fall into a trap of the enemy. Okay? Some of us leave on purpose. I'm done with this. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm tired of this. I'm out of here. It doesn't matter how you got lost. What matters is that you get found. We don't know any, we have no idea why this sheep got lost and we have no idea how this coin got lost. All we know is that it was lost and that the important thing was for it to be found, all right? Change your perspective on yourself and on other people. Say, they're so lost because of this and this and this. You know what? All Jesus sees is a lost person. All Jesus sees is his prized possession is lost and he wants to find it. And it says, when he has found it, not if he finds it. Again, he knows where you are. He knows where to find you because he knows you. He knows you. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows what you think before you're going to think it. Hmm. He knows the desires in your heart. He knows you. He knows how you got lost, why you got lost, why you're in the situation you're in, and he comes after you. Because he knows you. Aren't you glad? I'm so glad knew, God knew where I was. <laughs> that he wasn't looking over here or over there and I was over there. <laughs> he knew exactly where I was and he found me right there because he knows me. And because he knows me, he wants me to know him. It's about relationship. He wants to eat supper with you. <laughs> he wants to be close to you, not just teach you right. Okay? Finally, joy, joy, joy. There's a whole lot of rejoicing going on in these two stories, right? There's a, and the one we read last week, too, the Lost Sons, it was a big party. 
There's a lot of rejoicing. There's a lot of joy. One thing people really need to understand is how happy God is. Especially Christians. Especially, come on, look at me. Christians. There's some people who don't understand God is happy. All you have to do is look at their face and their life. Okay? And I'm, if you're one of them, I'm not downing you. I'm telling you, you need to get happy. Okay? God is happy. People have a very incorrect view of God's holiness, of his sovereignty and his power and his might. You know, yes, God is absolutely perfect and just and pure and absolutely righteous in every way, but he is definitely, most definitely not sad and, not, and he's not uptight. Okay? He's God. Listen. He is the source of joy. He made joy. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Joy is a part of who God is and a part of who we're supposed to be. God's not, okay, yes, God is serious. And there are some very, very, very serious things about God and his holiness. And we've talked about them and we'll talk more about them. But I want you to see today how happy, 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 happy God is. And there is one thing that makes him the happiest, 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 happiest of all. And that's you in close relationship with him. He's happy. When you come, when a person comes and repents of their sin and says, I've been doing this and I've been doing that and I'm turning my back on all that junk and I want to come back to you. God's not like, oh my God, you did so many bad things. <laughs> Let me be depressed for a couple of days and then we'll, we'll start to work through it. God's happy. And there's nothing that makes him happier, happier than you. Getting happy too. And I don't mean happy because you watched a funny movie. Real true joy comes from understanding I give God joy. He takes delight and pleasure in me. He made me to enjoy me. And the only way I'll truly, truly, truly enjoy life, that life Jesus said, the thief came to steal, kill, and destroy, but he came to give us an abundant life. That is a life of joy that enjoys relationship with our creator, with our father, with the lover of our soul, with our best friend, Jesus. That's where real, true joy comes from. You've got to learn You've got to understand God finds joy in you and you've got to learn. We've got to learn to find joy in our relationship with him. A lot of times we don't experience the joy of our relationship with him because we're trying to find joy all over the place. And it's half joy. Real joy, joy that remains, joy that goes on and on and on. Even when things are tough and difficult and you have reasons to be depressed. And there's still something on the inside of you that there's joy comes from a personal, intimate, close relationship with God. And then you can only have that joy if you realize he enjoys you. <laughs> One last tell your neighbor thing today. Tell your neighbor. He loves you. But you know what? He kind of likes you too. You're all that in a bag of chips. You're the last Coke in the desert. <laughs> You're the last tortilla in a taco joint. <laughs> hey. <laughs> You're the last fried catfish in a country dinner. <laughs> he enjoys you. And you guys, we've got to find joy in him. And we also got to, as a church, listen, at Encounter Church, I just want to make this clear. At Encounter Church, we get really happy when lost people get found. Jesus invites us to join in to his joy. Finding joy in our relationship with him, but also finding joy in helping others find relationship with him. You can stand up and RJ, you can come back.
Where's your perspective been? God has a different one. You are that one dollar bill out of the hundred that would separate him from his prized possession. Are you just a face in the crowd? Do you feel just like one of in seven billion people on the earth? Or do you know that you're God's prize possession, that you were made for Him? Believe His perspective today. You're highly, highly, highly valuable to God. How about your relationship with him? Have you just been trying to live right and do things right? Or have you understood that it's all about your heart relationship with him, how close your heart is to Jesus? have joy today in knowing that God finds joy in you if I could have my pastors just come up here with me have e-group leaders come if I need more help I'll call in in just a minute calls for prayer today. I want to ask you and I beg you today to truly respond as you need. Don't think about it too much. Just respond to the Lord. If you're the one that you've been you you got lost somehow some way you got trapped, you wandered away, you got tricked, you left on purpose, but you know you have not been in close relationship with the Lord. And today, you know you're here because Jesus came to find you and you need to get back right in your relationship with God. If that's you, I wanna invite you to come up here. We wanna pray with you.